Excellent. Well, thank you again uh, for having me here. And so as, as Jane mentioned, um, and you know, good morning, good evening, and sort of good afternoon to everyone from around the world who's logged into this. So I really, really appreciate that as well, given the time zones. Um, as Jane mentioned, I want to talk a little bit about cooperation and collaboration, um, but I want to talk about it in the context of when we think of these aspects of what does it mean to collaborate and what does it mean to cooperate, we often weigh the risk of what would happen if we spend all of this time, effort, energy, money, everything else that goes into it, into cooperating and it doesn't work out. So we, we come at this from the perspective of, you know, what does it mean? What do I get out of it? How does this move my agenda? Where does this take me? And even if that, what do I get out of it is very, very um, globally focused, even if it's very positive and it's very other and altruistic driven, there's still an agenda that we're moving that gives us some sort of personal um, accomplishment of goals through it. So there's a different set of trade-offs that we make when we come at these, these ideas. Um, but that concept of what collaboration and cooperation make changes a lot when we start thinking about uncertainty and in the realm of sort of looking at collaboration and cooperation in the nexus of environmental dilemmas and climate change, which is what my research looks at. Um, so what I want to start with are some definitions. Our, our way of understanding and thinking about um, the trade-offs that we make in choices, and particularly choices that have a huge environmental component to them, are what are the possible outcomes from the set of options available to me, and what are the possible set of probabilities associated with it. And these can be sort of defined or undefined. And as you can see where I'm going, you can probably guess where I'm going with this. It sets up a very nice set of quadrants of which turns out there's only one and one only that we're really, really, really familiar with. We like the quadrant of risk. This is the quadrant that helps us sort of say, we have tools to understand this. Even though I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, I have enough tools where I feel comfortable having made this decision for a while in this quadrant of what tomorrow might look like. So I can think about differences amongst products quality, among suppliers, look at past analysis, look at their on-time delivery, look at their defective return products, um, do my data analysis, come up with some a whole bunch of you know, economic theories, uh, speak to this quadrant, and, and figure out what I should be doing. I can be fairly certain of what I might be getting, even though I can't predict the future and never know what's happening. But when we get into the world of climate change and environmental dilemmas, and yes, I'm not a food packaging person, so I will speak of this from that climate change lens because that is where the work I do, but the parallels with the kinds of dilemmas I've heard over the last two days are phenomenal. And so I think you'll see those connections as well. Um, you know, we're really talking about times where probabilities are unknown. We have an idea that something's going to change, but we don't actually know with what certainty. Um, we certainly sometimes know something is going to change, but we don't know actually what that change might look like. Um, we don't know what would happen when we move production in a certain area towards a certain direction versus we actually change timeframes along other decisions. Um, and then of course, there's the realm of ignorance, which I will not talk about today in the interest of time. So what I am gonna do today is really focus on considering this sort of diagonal between uncertainty and ambiguity. Um, and so let's let's think about that diagonal a little bit, but before I, I get into sort of what that means and, and why is it that I'm talking about uncertainty and ambiguity in this, in this um, context, it's because they're here to stay. And, and if they're here to stay, especially given a lot of, you know, what we've heard over the last two days, and certainly the speakers that came right before me alluded to this, right? We don't actually know what certain things mean. We don't know what the ramifications of certain um, conversations might be. Um, we need to start thinking about what does that mean? And what does that mean for me comes to the question of what does that mean for environmental choices? And what does that mean getting comfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity when I have complex interdependent dilemmas that, that, I, that I'm facing in which I need to make choices? Um, so let me take a minute and define complex interdependent dilemmas as I understand them. And this is, forgive me for the oversimplification here. Um, and, and my tool of choice in the research I do is game theory, and particularly it's uh, behavioral decision-making in the context of cooperative game theory. So if I seriously oversimplify a lot of what I've heard of the last two days, um, and I go back to maybe t uh, yesterday's whole food example, what we're talking about is a decision matrix of the following kind. We're essentially saying that if you have multiple decision makers making multiple choices, but let's simplify it to two, and perhaps it's two um, food retailers that are making a choice between what sort of packaging materials do I use? And do I actually look to maximize my own um, individual profitability for this quarter in this moment in this, of time through all of my risk analysis? Or do I actually consider um, the uncertain ramifications of what this might look like across a triple bottom line, not knowing when those returns might come to me if they ever come at all, but certainly understanding that I need to be thinking in that, in that way. Um, if we sort of think of this as the basic dilemma choice that's facing and the set of trade-offs that's facing um, these decision makers. And in my, in my 
uh, work over the last, you know, certainly prior to becoming an academic as, as a consultant and as a banker, and certainly over the last 15 years as an academic, what I've encountered is these are frankly off, often the kinds of trade-offs that real um, choices come down to. They are oversimplified, but nonetheless reflect a reality. So Nash um, equilibrium, John Nash, I mean, in this, in this matrix, basically you don't wanna be at a one and you wanna to aspire to a four, but in everyone aspiring to the four, what we land up with is an Nash equilibrium of where nobody's better off. And we land up in the situations that we have, right? We are all individually maximizing our own gain and in the long run end up with everyone being worse off. So what does that translate to in terms of um, the, where do we go from here, right? Do we just sort of say, well, everyone's gonna do what they're gonna do. And so therefore we should just regulate um, the heck out of everything and let it let it go at that. But we know that doesn't really work very well either. We know that when you start um, through a number of other sort of studies, when you start over-regulating, you actually move everyone to the lowest common denominator. As important as that is, there needs to be social governance around regulation. So how can we create these mechanisms of social governance and social conversation that will move us ahead? And that's a lot of what I'm going to try and share in about three and a half minutes with all of you today. So bear me if I speak super fast, bear with me. Um, the question that I've been asking over the last many decades, a uh, couple of decades um, in my research and that people have asked for the last half century is, is there a way around John Nash's all defect, everyone's out to get everyone equilibrium? Can we actually create a cooperative equilibrium? Can we move in the direction of where we're all willing to take a little bit less in the, short, in the short run to make sure we're all collectively better off in the long run? What can we do to move conversations in that area? Um, and basically what I'm gonna tell you, what the insights from behavioral decision-making tell us is that it's in the framing and it's in the social context. It's how you frame the decision and how you contextualize it in the social structures in which we live. Um, so let me share with you some, some research to actually, so you don't have to take my word for it. Um, the first of this is certainly when you were framing, what are we talking about? And here I go back to the idea of uncertainty. So if this is a complex interdependent dilemma that I am going to try and solve and make choices with the best information I have, given all the uncertainty that surrounds it, how do I actually think through this? So we um, have run, most of what I'm gonna show you in the next few slides are, are single graphs, but they're actually um, often a graph from one study and we've done six or seven in the area that kind of replicate the pattern. So you'll, you'll sort of see these generalizable results. Um, so what we found when we started thinking about this sort of idea of it's in the framing and, and what does that mean for uncertainty, it's really how you think about and frame uncertainty. Um, so we asked um, participants that was this included agribusiness CEOs in Argentina, it included executive MBAs in Japan and Spain, and it included um, sort of, you know, regular people um, throughout our research uh, panel in, in a number of other countries, including US, India, and a bunch of others. And what we found was when we asked people to make choices in certain economic uh, environmental dilemmas, and by the way, we pay our participants to the extent that we're doing things in the lab or in a panel for the uh, actual money based on the choices they make. So these, this is, you know, they're actually seeing the real benefit. These are not hypothetical decisions. Um, we asked them, well, you're gonna make a choice as um, to make some trade-offs for, for water management, land use, et cetera. Um, and we gave them the choices in three different economic frames. In the first frame, we said, you're bound to get a gain. So as an individual in a defect, all defect, individual selfish choice, you make more of a gain. Um, if you are going to be collectively good, you're gonna make a little bit less of a gain, but you're still gonna gain. You're definitely gonna lose. You're gonna lose more if you do the collectively correct thing. You're gonna lose less if you do the selfish thing. Always, there's always benefit to the individual for being selfish, because that's how these lemmas are set up. And then what are you going to do under uncertainty? You actually don't know whether there's going to be a gain or a loss, um, and you don't know sort of the amount associated with it. Um, and this is what we got. So what we essentially got was that when people perceive uncertainty as a threat, there's no difference in what they do um, in gains and losses, whether they perceive uncertainty as being a threat or an opportunity. But there's a huge difference when you actually don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. If you think of that uncertainty as a glass half empty and as a threat, you want to defend what you have. You want to secure what you have, and you absolutely want to defect. But when you think of that uncertainty as opening up opportunities for conversation, for innovation, for technical advancement, for pushing the edge of the envelope further, you actually want to cooperate because you see the benefits that derive from it. So basically, it's, it's really about how you frame the uncertainty in that economic sense. But what we also found was that when you have a long-term association with something, um, so with that decision, and you're going to see the consequences from it year after year after year after year. So it's not that I did something 15 years ago and the people who pay the price of that and the stock price are 15 years later, you're actually seeing the consequences of it come out to you. 
you tend to frame that uncertainty very naturally, very differently. So to dig deeper on that idea, we actually went back to our agribusinesses in Argentina and started looking over time at how they made choices. And we looked at their land and water use, environmental choices, and so the dilemmas that they were solving for long-term versus short-term associations with um, the, the, the consequences of their actions. So when they own the land, and they're going to see the consequences of that, so they're going to see the impact of groundwater deterioration um, for land deterioration, for other sorts of things that come from it, versus when they um, don't see, sort of don't have that long-term association, what happens? Not surprisingly, when there is a long-term temporal association, that uncertainty gets defined differently. So I'm really thinking 10 years out, I'm thinking, this is like, you know, when you're a day trader and you're like watching the stock market do this versus you're actually looking at the trend line. So you tend to look at things very differently in the feedback loops that manifest. Um, and so, but don't take my word for it because then what we did was we worked with the government um, and actually created a program where long-term leases and associations with land. So when they own it, they cooperate more. When they have a short rented one year lease in the land, they don't cooperate. But then we actually create this program where you could have a three to five year lease on the land. And what we found was that the same agribusiness owners, these multi um, millionaires were actually saying, wait, in years one and two, this is a long-term association. I'm still thinking out to three, four, five, right? I'm gonna behave as if I own the land. But in the last year of my lease, now that's an annual window. So expanding the temporal window helps redefine uncertainty, but it also helps reframe what I'm actually focusing on in the choice per se. Um, so what I want to take away, you take away from here, so like, so what, why are you telling me all this? Well, because I think uncertainty and ambiguity provide an opportunity to rewrite old scripts. They provide an opportunity to reframe the conversation, to change the assumptions about timeframes, to rethink what metrics might matter. It doesn't just matter what I'm going to make this quarter. It also matters what state my groundwater is. And when I go to plant for the next cropping cycle, and I don't know what the equivalence of that would be for food packaging, forgive me, but I think um, you can sort of see that the parallels here in terms of that, right? So what would happen if I, um, and I think um, the presentation from Whole Foods actually alluded to some of this, that when we think long-term, we needed to think through the short-term costs to make sure we can get to those long-term outcomes. Um, so let's, that's sort of one piece of it, right? But these decisions aren't made in a vacuum. I am doing this in the context of everything that's going on. The shared community here tells you how deeply these decisions are contextualized. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, what we find is that social context, because the decisions are interdependent, who the other is that's actually impacted by these decisions becomes a really important factor. So, so far I've told you, you're making these decisions in agribusiness. And if you're um, worried about your groundwater, you're sharing an aquifer with spatially connected others, but those are you know, the people around you. That's who you're sort of dealing with, that's the other. What happens when that other is not quite that clear and, and, and that distinct, or that other is someone who matters a lot to me or someone whose guts I absolutely hate, right? What, what happens when we create these sort of group mechanisms, which we often do to try and actually encourage people to do the right thing vis-a-vis -vis, um, others in their, in their shared communities and their groups. So in that context, we started looking at some of these choices um, from, from that perspective, what happens when the person that I'm cooperating towards is more nuanced than just this other out there, right? And so I'm gonna change the game that we use in this a little bit to, to understand these studies a little bit um, and move you a little bit in direction of sort of, you know, if you'll bear with me, I'll walk you through this crazy matrix and what it looks like. What we do here is we're actually saying, like the two by two I showed you, that if you're selfish, you'll benefit yourself. You ignore people that you consider to be like yourself, your in-group and you ignore anyone else that you think isn't like yourself, the out group. So if you're you know, the person sort of pro, pro glass manufacturing in this forum and versus sort of, or pro plastics, whichever way you're coming at this, you have an in group and an out group and a very natural one at that. Um, you're essentially saying, I'm just gonna be, care about myself and I really don't, don't care about anyone else. That's sort of the selfish piece of this or the defection piece as we call it. But when I cooperate, who am I cooperating for might make a difference. And so to, tease that apart a little bit in the previous um, work that I showed you, what we look at is what happens when you can just cooperate to your in-group benefits and you ignore your out-group, or you can benefit your in-group and actively harm the out-group. So I really don't like you guys, and I want to make sure that you don't survive from this, um, versus actually think about cooperation universally and benefit everyone, right? So how might we sort of, how might these sort of um, differences play out. Um, and what we, um, ooh, what happened here? So, sorry. Um, so we ra um, ran a series of other studies that actually looked at what happens when I put your focus on who are the people with you that think like you? 
What happens when I live in my own echo chamber, when I don't have conversations with others who, who may or may not um, think like me? What, where does that sort of lead me? Versus I actually seek out and understand the commonalities of how, even though we might be different groups, we could actually belong to a larger group that's all one. I mean, ultimately, if I were to get philosophical, I'd say humanity is our largest in-group, but we're not going to go there right now. Um, so we ran a series of studies kind of examining this factor. And, and what we found um, was that when you have an intergroup focus, not very surprisingly, certainly you benefit the in-group. This is the green bars. Um, so, you know, you benefit sort of the, 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 the universal, but when you actually... Let me, let me restart that again. Let me rephrase that. When you have an intra-group focus, when you're focused on your own in-group, which are the orange bars, yes, you benefit, you have in-group love, you benefit your in-group. But turns out that when you actually push people into that focus and or you make that focus salient by saying to everyone, this group is threatened or this group is losing its power or this group may be impacted in ways that we don't know what uncertainty will bring. When you actually take uncertainty and make it an unknown for the group, what we end up getting is active outgroup hate. That, that number actually goes up. The contribution towards wanting to harm the outgroup goes up. And that's a little bit of a scary finding um, when we start to parse out the in-groups into small subsects because it means that no one's actually talking at the problem itself and looking to have conversations to, for a resolution, but more standing and digging their heels in in their own points. So then we started saying, well, what happens if we were to change that focus and start looking at people as a more sort of creating more of a universal or an intergroup inter focus? Um, and what we find there is that it changes the dynamic. So when we can step back and say, there is a connection, we're trying to solve the same problem, even if we're coming at it in two different ways, let's actually talk about the problem itself and figure out how that conversation might um, be able to be mutual, but it isn't enough to do that, right? Because if I Think the way I do and you think the way you do and we can't find that common ground, how do we move it? Um, so to dig a bit deeper for that, we actually, um, beyond sort of saying superordinate and subordinate identities can serve as facilitators of cooperation, which is very true, how do they do this? How might we use this mechanism to move that, that service of um, identities further? We started to look more into some of the social science behind this and started realizing that, well, affiliation is a very rapid process. And we it's been shown to happen without groups. And it's been shown to happen instantly when you encounter people who perhaps aren't present from your own in-group. Um, and so can we actually have meaningful community emerge from it? Um, and there's a lot of resources now coming out in this area that shows that, that you really can. And that when you have shared connections, you actually share a reality. Um, that can lead to increased cooperation. So to test that, we went back into the lab and this is a pure lab study. And what we actually did was we assigned a large number of people to a large number of different settings. And I'll walk you through this graph in a second. Um, but what we essentially did was we said, um, and by the way, I should also sort of, you know, have a trend running through here. In every st stage step of this, we're actually having people resolve environmental dilemmas. We're always asking them to make trade-offs between benefiting the triple bottom line versus benefiting themselves economically um, at every step of the way. That those are sorts of the, the underlying and underpinnings of, of the trade-offs they're making here. But what we had people do in this, in this study, in these the sets of studies that we ran, is that we essentially said, you're part of some group somewhere, um, it's a complete unknown, and you're kind of doing the task that the, everyone else is doing on your own. There isn't really a shared task. And then we assigned people to a minimal group and told them that everyone was doing the same task and they were sort of engaged in that, but it wasn't shared. They were still doing the task in, individually, even though they're part of a minimal group and they're um, engaging in the same tasks. Then we put people in the same minimal group, but we now had them do the task collectively. And as you can see, cooperation goes up. It goes up when you belong to a group and you think you're benefiting your in-group. Um, it goes up further when it belongs, um, when you think you're benefiting your in-group um, and and it's, um, you know, you're, you're sharing the task. What happens though, when you mix in groups and out groups and you put everyone in the same room and you have them sort of come together to um, do the task, but do it individually. There's not much cooperation um, while well, they're doing it individually. So you, you're asking where, where would the opportunity for cooperation be? We have people do the task and then we actually have them make choices of what they would do in terms of the investment in the resulting outcomes of uh, in the resulting task. Um, and so they're actually doing this again for, for real money and real trade-offs. Um, and what we found was that when you mix in groups and out groups, but don't have that shared reality, you don't actually get cooperation. This looks a lot like when you have an unknown group. It's like you sort of don't think there's any connection there. 
But the interesting part is what happens when you put in groups and out groups together, have them do a shared task and then have them come together to cooperate. The cooperation is close to 100%. And where that takes us um, is, is with my final so what's and, and, and the ending of this, which is simply to say that I think uncertainty and ambiguity are a chance and an opportunity for us. And we face them whether we like them or not, given where we're at environmentally and in terms of climate change and the global structure that we have today. And our, we have some tools from behavioral decision-making. We have some tools from cooperative game theory that I think um, we could perhaps use better and use more um, to start to create these sorts of conversations that can perhaps allow us to share a reality. So we are focused on um, not the short come immediate gratification, but what does that long-term collective outcome look like? that would actually leave us all economically and planetarily better off. Um, I'll leave you with those and many thanks to all of you for this opportunity, for letting me share my thoughts with you today. To collaborators, too many to list and, and everyone who's been funding this, this research over the years. Thank you.